Before I read the scripture, just uh, my fault. I didn't get this to Tom in time. We are about finishing up on the church directory. I need people who have not talked to me yet to please stop after church. I'm just right out to your left, and I need to get your information. And also, if, if you know someone who's not here, uh, I will be making personal visits and visiting with those people, and I really appreciate that. Today the word is Matthew 8, 5 through 13, and I will be reading from the Amplified Version. As Jesus went into Capernaum, a centurion came up to him, begging him, and saying, Lord, my servant boy is lying at the house, paralyzed and distressed with intense pains. And Jesus said to him, I will come, I will restore him. But the centurion replied to him, Lord, I am not worthy of, or fit to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant boy will be cured. For I also am a man subject to authority with soldiers subject to me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And I, I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard him, he marveled and said to those who followed him, those who adhered to him steadfastly, those who conform to his example in living, and those, if need be, in dying also. I tell you truly, I have not found so much faith as this with anyone, even in Israel. I tell you, many will come from east and west and will sit at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons and heirs of the kingdom will be driven out into darkness outside, where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Then to the centurion, Jesus said, Go! And it will be done for you, for you have believed. And the servant boy was restored to health at that very moment. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for the reading of your word and the example of, uh, of faith that we've just heard, for the privilege of singing your praises as we believe you hear our worship. We want to thank you for the privilege we have of gathering together. Father, I want to thank you for the this congregation and for the broader church, the church universal, and the work that you're doing in this world to bring people into your kingdom and to prepare them for eternal life with you. I'm thankful for the privilege of being part of that, for the involvement of this congregation in spreading that, for the prosperity that you've given the people in this congregation and their willingness to share it to help accomplish that goal. Pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless the people of this congregation and continue to bless the, the congregation's finances, that we might continue to have an impact for your kingdom. I thank you for hearing us. I thank you for what you're going to do through us in Jesus' name. Amen.
dancing doctor. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son,
Wasn't that beautiful? I get, I'm the luckiest guy in the church. I got to sit right in front of it. That was awesome. Thank you, everyone, for your time and your effort for that choir. That was awesome. I really enjoyed that. At this point, we can go ahead and have our children dismissed for Children's Church. I know the ladies have some uh, fun things planned in the toddler room and in, the, in Children's Church there. I love to see them. They're not thundering out of here like they do in some times, but they're, they're making their way that way. It's a joy to watch uh, all age groups in the church, but to see those kids going back and learning the things that I didn't get the privilege of learning when I was that age. I really appreciate that ministry. Uh, as a pastor, I get uh, several perks. I get to stand on the platform and see everybody's faces. I get to sit in the front and listen to the choir. Uh, this last week, I got to go to a conference and uh, learned a lot about missions, both foreign and domestic. I really enjoyed that and took an extra day and went and saw my grandkids. Uh, part of the reason I was able to do that is because I have a new friend who I found out this morning is also a family member. That somehow, we haven't figured that out yet, but uh, Jared Unruh agreed to come and speak for us this morning. And when I saw the... Um, the title and the passage, I was especially excited because uh, I think it's one of the best passages Matthew wrote. Of course, I probably could have said that about any passage that Matthew wrote. But Jared, will you come up and speak to us today? And before you do, I'm going to ask the Lord to bless you. So come on up here. Father, I want to thank you for Jared's willingness to speak today. Um, we've known each other a little bit in the past, but now we have a chance to know each other even better. It's such a joy to have brothers and sisters in Christ and the ministry that we can have together as we do your work. And as Jared speaks to us today, Father, I ask you to speak to each of our hearts, give you the right words that each of us needs to hear. Um, use his words through your spirit to speak to each of our hearts. Help us, Father, to walk out of here blessed, inspired, and just a little bit changed. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, yes, thank you, Mike, for the opportunity to come and to preach. Um, if you haven't already, I want to invite you to turn in your copy of the Scriptures to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, we're going to be zeroing in on verses 5 through 13, as was read uh, just a little while ago. And uh, if you're familiar with Jesus familiar with his teachings, as I'm sure many of you are, you'll know through Matthew's gospel in particular, you see this uh, somewhat of a slow burning fuse that runs through his gospel, uh, kind of putting this all together, and it's pointing to the authority of Jesus. And then we see the fuse kind of finally burn up at the end, chapter 19, well, it's actually not chapter 19. I'm saying that wrong. It's more like chapter 28. Towards the end of his gospel, and then Jesus says this when he gives this commission and this declaration, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all. All nations. Now, think about that phrase for a second, all nations, because we're going to see that again in our passage today. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I wonder, what do you think of when you think of authority? Is that a good term? Is it a negative term for you? What do you think of when you think of authority. Now, I'm pretty confident in saying that authority is a major issue 
you don't have to be shrewd to realize there is a widespread crisis in the whole area of authority. Men and women abuse it. Men and women are confused by it. High school and college age students are asking, is there any final authority or who's my authority? And sadly, we see our nation constantly fighting over it. But this isn't just something in society around us, not something that we just observe from a distance. No, friends, our issues with authority walk right into our living rooms, in our schools. It affects us in our businesses and wrecks our marriages. And in many churches, it undermines the Scripture. Our problem with authority, in other words, reverberates all around us all that we are. And this is true educationally, politically, socially. It's true morally and theologically. It was somewhere around uh, 14 years ago when we had our first child, I I, I started to read Ted Tripp's book, uh, Shepherding a Child's Heart. Maybe you've read it. If you haven't, I want to commend that to you. It gives practical tips on what it means for parents to, uh, to not own their children and do what they want with them, but they are simply stewards or under shepherds who are pointing their children to the Lord. And so in reading this book and giving lots of practical tips, there was one part that was the most influential to me, and it was hearing that the number one thing that a child needs to learn, say, by the time they are five years old, is they are a person under authority. That makes sense, right? Think about the authority that they will be under for the rest of their life. Authority is at the core existence of, of our lives. And so rightly understanding and submitting to authority is essential in all of life, but especially for what it means to be a Christian. Now, if you're with us this morning and you're not a Christian, I want to say welcome. I'm glad you're here, and I'm sure that the church is glad you're here as well. But you should know that Christians and non-Christians alike struggle with authority. You see, God created and established the world and everything in it, including you and me, to live under and find joy and peace in His loving rule. In other words, in His authority. We were created to delight in Him as our Lord and treasure Him and find comfort in his sovereign care over us. But instead, just like Adam, in our sin, each of us have rejected and rebelled God's authority. And apart from God's divine intervention, apart from his saving grace, we are literally hell-bent on being our own authority. And you can see this from the youngest child in your home. Parents, you remember. Grandparents, you remember. When you were laying your children down for a nap and they would get red-faced and they'd arch their back and they'd get stiff, did you teach your child to rebel against your authority? No, you never had to teach anybody to rebel against authority. That is part of our sinful condition. No one was taught to reject authority. We have a natural desire, all of us, to look for authority. Man, we want authority. We crave authority. Our problem is, however, that we conclude that the greatest and best authority is within us. We look inward and we start crowning ourselves as the source of all authority and establish our own kingdoms and place our own self on the throne, setting ourselves up as king or queen, governor or president of our own lives. And and this is our biggest problem. This is our sickness, if you were. And it's for this reason that Jesus came, and he says in 1 John 3, 8, that he came to destroy the works of the devil, the undermining his authority kind of works that the devil would establish in each and one of our our hearts. But if we're sticking to Matthew's gospel, he puts it, Jesus puts it this way. In Matthew chapter 9, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. It's the sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but to call sinners. And so what we're seeing as we look here at chapter 8, these these miraculous healings, they help highlight for us Jesus doing just that. Jesus coming for the sick. 
Jesus coming under authority and with authority to call all of those who know they are sinful, despised, and rejected. In the passage right above the one we're reading now, uh, uh, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 8, this healing of the leper, you're familiar with that one. Jesus is showing, or the scriptures are showing, Jesus is cleansing power over physical, the physically unclean. Right? It's an outward picture and a foretaste of what Jesus will do ultimately on the cross with the uncleannesses in our life. And each of us, we stand before Christ dirty and stained with the shame of sin. And we need a physician, someone to heal, someone to make us clean. And that's exactly what it says in Ezekiel. He will remove a hard heart and give us a heart of flesh. He will clean, uh, clean our, our, cleanse us from all our uncleannesses, is what it says. We have sin in our lives, either the past or the present, that make us feel untouchable. I don't know if that's where you're at today. Something in our life, past or present, that makes us feel untouchable. Sins that we've struggled with for years. Sins that others have committed against us that make us feel this way. And in and of ourselves, we are unclean before a holy God. But friends, the good news is that through Jesus' death on the cross, he takes the shame and the filth of our sin upon himself in order to make us clean. And now, not talking about the leper, but moving into this next passage of chapter 5, we see Jesus doing this again. This time, but it's not with an unclean Jew, but an ethnically outcast Gentile. And not just any Gentile, but he is a soldier. Look at verse 5 with me. When he had entered into Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. Jesus is walking into the town of Capernaum. This is believed to be his hometown, right? Kind of thinking about missions. He's, he's been out on the mission field. He comes home. He's on furlough with a group of people following him. And just as he enters into this town, a centurion came forward to him. In other words, this centurion isn't just any soldier. No, he was a career serviceman, a soldier commanding hundreds of men, a man responsible for the discipline of the regiment. Centurions were thought of like the, the cement that would hold the whole battalion together. So this man Believe it or not, he understood authority, and he had the power and the backing of Rome behind him. But by the Jews, this man was not only viewed as an ethnic outsider, right, to the promises, stranger to the promises of God, but he was one who would deliberately oppose the people of God. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said it this way of this man, that the centurion was Israel's oppressor. So what a scene. Stop for a moment and think about this. This is not normal. Jesus walking into his hometown and a centurion walking up to him, you would never have seen that. That didn't happen in those days. And this is what makes the account of Jesus here and Jesus' response so stunning, probably to, G to Matthew's Jewish readers. But I want you to notice a couple things. Notice first the way the centurion comes to Jesus. First, he comes with a great need or a concern. This is not unlike the leper who was Jewish, except it wasn't for himself. It was for his servant who was suffering terribly with some body-numbing illness. We don't know what that was. We just know that he was sick, paralyzed, can't move, can't get out of bed. I want us to take a moment just so we don't miss this again. What an example of human kindness. What an example of being in tune with others' pain and suffering, with weeping with those who weep and bearing with one another's burdens. Church, what a picture for us on how we ought to pray, as you did just a while ago, praying for the needs and the concerns, bringing petitions to God for one another. But not only for us individually and as a church, but 
What about you who are in charge of other people that have employees? Those that you watch over and supervise, people that are under your charge. I hope that you are asking, how am I showing concern for the people that I manage? The people that are under me? Especially when it comes to their health concerns. Now, there's no reason, as I said, for this centurion to be acting like this towards his servant. That wasn't the norm in the Roman Empire. Listen to how Aristotle talked about friendships which are possible in life. He writes, and I quote, There can be no friendship nor justice towards inanimate things. Indeed, not even, a whore, not even towards a horse or an ox, nor yet a slave as a slave. For master and slave have nothing in common. Likewise, Cato, a Roman writer on agriculture, would give advice saying that men should throw out an old and sick slave like they would a worn-out farm tool. This wasn't supposed to be happening. Two things. A centurion walking up to Jesus? Unheard of. A centurion giving, um, and a Roman citizen giving care and concern for a slave? Unheard of. You don't see that in that day. But, but there's this extraordinary man, this centurion, and it's quite clear that he loved his, his servant. And perhaps it is his unusual and unexpected gentleness that just moved Jesus when he came to him. Brothers and sisters, we need to remember that love always covers a multitude of sins. So let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God. So he comes with this great concern. Second, we see in this passage that the centurion comes humbly recognizing Jesus' authority. He calls Jesus Lord. This is the same phrase, the same word that the leper used, Lord. He re repeats that plea, meaning master or ruler. And again, that's not what you would expect from a man in his position. Yet he pleads with Jesus. He begs Jesus. He urges him to heal his servant. Friends, this is how we are to come to Jesus. Have you ever heard someone say, we, we need to have a come to Jesus moment? Right? And they think of just this one time. Or maybe when you came to Jesus, it was, I raised my hand, I walked an aisle, I prayed a prayer, I came to Jesus. Well, we come to Jesus like this man again and again and again. We come to him I like how Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, writes, and I'm going to change the phrasing just a little bit, but the point is the same. We come to Jesus when we're discouraged, frustrated, weary, and disenchanted. We come cynical and empty. We come when we are running on fumes and feel like we are constantly running up a descending escalator. We come thinking, man, how could I have messed up this bad again on Sunday, no less? We come when we feel that God might be disappointed in me. We come to Jesus wondering if I've just shipwrecked my life beyond repair. Friends, we are to come to Jesus needy, and we are to come humbly. You might be asking, okay, Jared, I hear you. We're supposed to come to Jesus. That's what he wants. We're to be like this centurion in a way, coming appealing to him, needy and humbly. But what happens when I come? What will Jesus be like when I come to him? What will he say? Will he be harsh? Will he lob down some kind of a pep talk? What will Jesus be like when I come to him with all of my mess, with all of my indiscretions, with all of my selfishness, with all of my stuff. Look at verse 7. This man came to Jesus. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. <laughs> Friends, the man didn't even get to ask Jesus to do anything. Maybe it was implied. He just said, my servant is sick. And Jesus jumped right in, almost like an interruption. He didn't, get, Jesus didn't, he didn't get to say, what do you want me to do? The leper got to do that. He says, if you will, which means, Jesus, if you have the desire, would you heal me? 
Instead, Jesus jumped right in and he, and, and other, and he says, I'm in. In other words, I'll do it. I love showing grace and mercy. That's, Jesus is like, that's my thing. That's who I am. It's all about, I love pardoning and relieving and comforting all those who are sick and will come to me for help. That just stokes my fire, Jesus is saying. That's what I'm all about. And so Jesus agrees to help this man, servant. But, the, but the, notice the man, the centurion, he replies, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. He explains in, chat, in verse 8 and 9 there, he says, For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. See, like the crowds following Jesus, the centurion recognizes Jesus' authority. He says, I too am a man under authority. But unlike the crowds, he seems to understand it and bow a knee to it. The centurion, he isn't chasing the show. He's not on the Jesus miracle tour, if you were. No, he cancels the show. He says, Jesus, don't come. All you have to do is say it. All you have to do is say the word. Your command, your word, carries all the power that's necessary to heal. In other words, he is saying, Jesus, your word is enough for me. Your promise is enough for me. If you say you'll do it, Jesus... I have no reservation. I don't need to put my fleece out. I don't need to go and ask. I don't need a sign to say that you will do something. I believe your word, and it's enough. Now, we can stop right here, and we can preach a whole sermon on the power and the sufficiency of the word of God. And I'll ask you, when you think about the promises of God, are you like this? Do you feel that God's word is enough for you? That when he says, I'll be with you and I'll never leave you, I won't forsake you. When it says in his word that there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, are you clinging to those promises? Or are you doubting his word? Are you doubting that it's true? Because friends, that's what faith is. Faith is, is trusting in God's promises. That's simply what it means. Trusting that God, that you will take him at his word and that he will do exactly what he said he would do. When you came to believe and trust in Jesus, you put your faith in him as we say. You've trusted in him or relied in him. What you're saying is, I believe, Jesus, that in the future you will do something for me, and that is you will pardon me, and I won't have a guilty verdict when I stand before God on the day of judgment. You're trusting in his promises like this man did. This is genuine faith, just like Abraham in Genesis 15 when it tells us that he believed God. He didn't immediately see the results, right? God promised him that he would have a child, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and it waited all the way to the point where he physically could not have a child, he and his wife. And then God said, now that you can't do anything about it, watch me. I'm going to do it. And here he believed God, and the scripture tells us that it was counted to him as righteousness. So here the centurion, verse 10, when Jesus heard him say this, when Jesus heard the man say, you don't need to come, I believe you, I don't need, it. I don't need to see it, I don't need to have any evidence, I trust you completely, Jesus, I have faith in you, it says that Jesus marveled. And he said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with you, uh, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Do you underline in your Bible? I underline the word, Jesus marveled. Jesus was amazed. This word for marveled, it's used in Matthew's gospel in other places. Matter of fact, it's used in chapter 7, right before this. Uh, if you're looking at the scriptures there, look at uh, chapter 7, verse 28. It says, when, G when Jesus finished these sayings, in other words, when uh, the, the Sermon on the Mount, when he was teaching, when he was doing all that, the crowds were astonished. That's the same word. Astonished at his teachings. 
For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not like their scribes. But here, this word, when it says Jesus marveled, this is the only time in Matthew's gospel that it refers to Jesus marveling at anything. That Jesus was amazed at anything. Jesus is marveling and amazed at the simple and humble, absolute trust for his authority and the power of his word. So much so that none of the Jewish people that Jesus has encountered before, all of the people following him, including the disciples, had displayed up to this point. And notice when Jesus turns, after he hears this man, he turns not to the centurion and say, hey, you have great faith. No, he turns to the followers, the Christians, those who are following after him, if you were, mostly Jews probably at this point. He says, this is what it really means to follow me. This is what it means to have faith in me. So the example that we're seeing here, true followers, Jesus says, they don't chase me for my miracles, but they follow me because I'm worthy of their faith and devotion. This is real faith. It is humbly relying on my word, my promises, that though you are sinful and flawed, You are loved and welcomed at the eternal kingdom feast. That's why Jesus turns in the next little passage there, the next verses to this banquet. Look at verse 11. Jesus says, I tell you, many will come from east and west. Does that kind of sound like all nations? Go and baptize in all nations. Go therefore right? Jesus says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness in the place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, the Jews, they longed for and they looked for in anticipation the day when the Messiah would come and hold a great banquet reclining at table. But they never once for a moment, it crossed their minds that any Gentile would ever sit down at that table. That any sinner would ever sit down at that table. This is why Jesus' words about Gentiles being a part of the kingdom were so shocking to Matthew's Jewish readers. Jesus is essentially saying to those who are following him that their Jewishness Their heritage doesn't guarantee them anything in eternity. There's only one way to the kingdom. There's only one invitation, and it's only by those who would put their faith in Christ alone. There's no other way to the table. Those who grew up in the family, the people of God who were given the promises of God, he says they're going to be thrown into outer darkness to a place where there's gnashing of teeth. In other words, they're going to go to hell. They're going to be away from God forever in a place where his wrath will never stop because they had no faith in the promises of God. They did not believe in Jesus' word. The only thing that matters, friends, in this life when it comes to a relationship with God, is do you have faith in Jesus' words? Do you have faith? And this same truth that we're seeing in this scripture applies to us today. Your eternal destiny, my eternal destiny, whether thrown into outer darkness or welcomed to the table is dependent on how we come to Jesus. We need to come needy. Are you needy? This morning, what are you needy for? Some of us would say, man, I need a healing. I need some physical. I need financial relief. I need something in this life. And Jesus knows, and he's concerned about all of those things. But the greatest need that you and I have is to continually come to Jesus and know that we need him in our soul, that we need him to change the relationship between us and God, that we need him for eternity. And then to come humbly, which means 
again and again. We never have it figured out. We can never say, well, I got this Christian thing down. Jesus, you, I'm, you're ha- you should be glad to have me on your team. Now, we continually come broken, humbly before God and trust in his word. Verse 13 says that Jesus gladly healed the centurion's servant immediately at a very moment. Friends, if you come to Jesus needy and humbly, he's not going to say, well, you go clean yourself up and then come back to me. He says, you're welcome and loved at my table. Even though you are sinful and you're flawed, you are welcome at my table. You're welcome at his table. Come to him needy and humbly and trusting in his word. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we humble ourselves before you and the authority that you have made known to us in your word and through the person of your son, Jesus Christ, a friend of sinners. Oh Lord, we see uh, in this text great faith that made Jesus marvel. A faith that caused him to be astonished at what he saw in Israel and the Jews around him, the people of God. Lord, we are so thankful that you welcome sinners to the table. We are so grateful that you have given us your word so that we can hear what it looks like to come to you in true faith and repentance. Lord, thank you for healing our hearts, for restoring a relationship with the Father. Thank you for the sacrifice that you gave, which was your life in our place so that we might have hope, that we might not be cast into outer darkness, but stand in your marvelous light. Lord, may we be changed by that wonderful news today and would it affect everything that we do. And Lord, for those here today who are not coming to you humbly, not coming to you needy, who've never put their faith in you, Lord, I pray that you would turn their hearts towards you, that you would call them to repentance and great faith, a marveling kind of faith where they trust in your promises and not just looking for signs and miracles in this life, the benefits that we might find. Lord, we ask this and we pray in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.